So we have a session now on common sense childbirth, improving outcomes for women and children, lessons from the United States of America. And our presenter is Jenny Joseph, the founder and executive director of Common Sense Childbirth and creator of the JJ Way. So coming from a different country, coming from a different time zone, and probably coming from a slightly different angle over to Jenny Joseph. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here and to participate in this amazing, amazing event. Um, wow, yes. So I've titled my um, presentation, Saving Lives. And um, there's a reason for that. And as I go through, I'm hoping that I can um, engage you all in understanding why I've said such a um, dramatic thing at the beginning, also transforming maternal health care in America's maternal toxic zones. And again, just wanting to draw your attention to there's such a problem here, um, often not spoken about, often very hidden, and that COVID-19 has kind of just brought to the fore, but it was already here. So I consider that we're almost at this point, we're in our own pandemic, if you will, and that we have had an ongoing issue. So just a quick background about myself. I'm British trained, I'm British born and raised, um, um, immigrated to the States in 1989, but I was a British trained midwife as a direct entrant back in the day. Um, with my picture back in 1981 when I was graduating. Um, and I've been here, like I say, it's going to be 31 years. And it's been quite the experience, let me tell you. Came into Orlando, um, I met an amazing man, we fell in love, we did the long distance romance, came back, got married, came with an oblivious mindset, just, well, oh, I'll go get a job as a midwife because I know Americans have babies. Hmm, that didn't quite work out. So over these 31 years, I've been really fighting a fight. I feel sometimes very lonely in that fight because um, Americans don't really have midwifery as their main practice, as their main um, maternity care providers. We are still fringe. We are still considered, oh, a midwife, ah. Um, and we are also fighting from a perspective of a monopoly of um, the maternity care services through obstetrics. And um, so I've worked hard to bring maternity care through the midwifery model to the forefront. And in the Orlando, Central Florida area, um, we've established some midwifery practices that have made a big difference. And luckily, um, I think beginning to make some headway, getting some um, response, getting some information out there and getting some notoriety about what we do too. Um, here's, I was featured in the New York Times uh, 2018, um, talking about the work, again, about making pregnancy safer for women. So, you know, I mean, here's me with a transfer case. I want to share this picture because this picture sort of captured what it's like for me working as a midwife. I have a freestanding birthing center where I see healthy, low-risk women who choose out-of-hospital birth. And that's not very common in the United States either. And then, um, and that grew out of a home birth practice that I started when I first arrived. And I also have a clinic, which I call the Easy Access Clinic, where I see women who are more marginalized, who are not necessarily low-risk, who are in a system that has them trapped and stuck and unable to access the quality and the correct care that they need. And I do almost like a midwifery triage for those women. So this picture was the picture that showed me after a transport, this mama, you can't really see underneath all the blankets and towels, but she just pushed out a 10 pound enormous child vaginally um, due to having had um, a, you know, a timely transfer, a necessary transfer. We did need some support to finish this birth, but um, I have worked hard to establish relationships with hospitals. So I don't have privileges myself at the hospital. I'm not allowed to deliver the baby at the hospital, but I have over the years built strong relationships locally such that I can come in with my patients and do the continuity piece here. So you see her husband, you see this look of triumph as this mother has received well, treated well and supported to fulfill on her birth plan that did go a slight, slightly awry, but look at their outcome. But let me go back to what's happening in the United States. Let's be clear what's happening here. In general, um, the public health goals are put out every 10 years, every decade, and the government calls them healthy people goals. And so as I learned about those goals, as I got used to the American life, um, realized that these healthy people goals were quite lofty. 
And so they should be, because this is always what we're looking for. So, for example, the Healthy People 2010, they um, overarchingly aim to increase quality in years of life, but they call for the elimination of health disparities. You can imagine how thrilled I was to learn about that, because at that point, I'd have been in the country a decade as well, and I hadn't seen anything along the lines that was looking to eliminate health disparities. The Healthy People 2020 goals showed up and they were expanded. Oh, we're not only going to eliminate, but now we're going to achieve health equity while we're at it and improve the health of all groups. So I was like, oh, okay, cool. But somehow couldn't see that in practice. So as I said, I was in Florida, I'm still in Florida. And um, I just show, wanted to show this slide because this helps us see how Florida and the US 2010 objectives matched up. These measures were for adequate or adequate plus prenatal care. That in and of itself gives me pause. What on earth does that mean? But they were measuring it. Um, Preterm births, low birth weight births and infant mortality. This is the overall population, all races, all ethnicities, all people. And so Florida and the United States didn't compare that well. So for example, for preterm births, the goal was for 7.6, but we were at 13.8. You know, low birth weight was five, we were at 8.7. This is very common and this was what we were looking at. I also want to point out, though, but by 2020, it looked like we were making some progress here. Look how nicely these balance, right? Like, oh, you see the big gaps, you see the disparities, but oh, we're getting it together. We're catching up with ourselves. But I also want to point out how figures and statistics can skew how we see and how we perceive how well we're doing or not. So, for example, all of a sudden, the adequate, adequate prenatal care, adequate plus prenatal care, we were almost neck and neck. But look, the bar moved, went to 80, and we also changed the parameter. Same with preterm, suddenly the goal was 11.4. And so at 13.6, we weren't that far away. The low birth weight goal was suddenly 7.8. And so again, we weren't that far away. And infant mortality was neck and neck. That points you back to how it looked before and how it looked by 2020. I haven't put the 2030 goals up because I've got nothing to say at this point on these goals. Another way to look at what's going on in the states, and this graph is just from the um, Orange County, which is a, the um, county that I live in, in Orlando. Um, it shows preterm births in Orange County from back in 2000 to 2006. It doesn't matter what it shows, because without even looking at the legend, you would know that the purple line at the top is going to be black, the black race, because we have always got that much of a disparity between any ill, whether it's heart disease, cancer, you name it. There is going to be a line which is going to be markedly different, higher, larger, greater, and it's going to be black people because this is what's going on in America. So put another way, our babies are dying. That's what's going on. Um, for as long as I've been here, I've been able to say at least twice as many black babies are being born too soon, too small, too sick. But in actuality, in many areas and jurisdictions, it could be as many as three to four times. And while I got here, we were focused on infant mortality in the beginning years. We began to realize, oh, hold on, they have mothers. The mothers are so ill and sick that the babies are being born premature, low birth weight. And of course, women are dying too. And in the last 10 years, I would say we focused on maternal mortality finally. This picture is um, from 2010, we were at Capitol Hill with a briefing with Amnesty International, which was the first group to bring the maternal death, um, the maternal um, crisis to the American um, recognition, or at least saying it out loud. And um, the, they published Deadly Delivery, very important um, art, um, writing that helped us understand how bad it was. So two to three women die daily in the United States, about 700 or so a year. Not a large amount when you compare, compare to developing nations, but this is not a developing nation. This is not a developing nation. This is unconscionable that the um, numbers are so high. But here's what's really important to understand. We say, we say about 50,000 or maybe 60,000 near misses happen every year, people who nearly die. That is a difficult number to capture because if you're nearly dead, you're not really counted. If you leave your maternity experience from the hospital through the ER, through the ICU, through the cardiac care unit, you're not counted. If you don't speak out, you're not counted because even though you have the pain, the trauma from nearly dying, um, actually you're still alive. We have a problem here. 
And of course, the disparity is worth mentioning. Three to four times as many African-American women are dying as white women um, due to um, maternal related issues. In certain areas, certain states, as New York, for example, 12 times as many. Hmm? It's really outrageous. So of course we just blame the women. Well, of course, you know, it's these social determinants of health. Oh, these are the maternal toxic areas. It's because of the poverty, it's because of the stress, it's because of the violence, it's because, because, because. But in actuality, I, I coined this phrase maternal toxic because I think it sums up how mothers and um, their babies are at risk wherever they may be. So this is a picture of that same woman I showed you earlier who um, just before she delivered was, you know, received well, like I say, supported, and she was able to have a straightforward vaginal delivery of a potentially complicated case. And it, for her, the hospital was not maternal toxic. But this woman I'm gonna show you now, she didn't have that same experience. This is a series of pictures of a woman that she actually delivered en route in the ambulance. She was in my clinic coming in for um, a prenatal checkup at 38 weeks, looking miserable, complaining that she'd been up all night, and didn't know what to do with herself. When I checked her, she was eight centimeters. Um, the women who choose my clinic also choose hospital birth. They know they're gonna be delivered by the physicians when they reach the hospital. The midwives don't follow from my practice. So she was so close, I said, let me ride with her in the ambulance just in case. And sure enough, baby was born en route. So you see her newly delivered, looking quite shocked. As soon as we got to the hospital, I insisted on getting the baby skin to skin, which we were able to do at that point. And you see how she's there transitioning, getting a little bit more accustomed to what happened, still figuring it out. Importantly, you see the baby also just doing beautifully, pinking up, coming round. And you see this mom begin to smile and relax. I'm pointing this out because first of all, this was a choose, chosen hospital birth. She wanted a hospital birth. She wasn't expecting to be in labor in my clinic. I just happened to see her at the time she was about to transition. Why this is important is that after this picture was taken, she was taken upstairs to the maternity floor. The fight was ensuing because she still had the placenta inside her and the physicians were arguing about who was going to deliver the placenta because that tied into who was going to be able to bill for the birth. That happened around this woman who was newly delivered, who was just settling out of her trauma of having delivered practically, you know, in the ambulance on the way in. And then what happened then really encapsulates for me how quick the maternal toxicity kicks in. She wanted to breastfeed the baby. The baby had been skin to skin since we got her delivered. The nurse took the baby and said, the baby needs a bottle. Mother said, okay. Didn't have enough time to process or understand what was going on. It was madness. In that moment, that changed from being a straightforward, helpful environment into what I call maternal toxicity. Different women being treated differently. The outcomes are impacted by that. That breastfeeding experience, that breastfeeding relationship never got established. So quality in perinatal care, what does it really look like? Look how they're measuring. Oh, adequate prenatal care. What does that mean? how many visits she had, how often she came into the building, how often somebody put hands on her or didn't put hands on her. Is it services? Is it interventions? Is it the type of practitioner or is it the will to provide that quality care? Recent work out of um, um, British Columbia, um, Professor Vidam, I know she presented yesterday, that look at what we've discovered in Looking at the overall experience of mothers in America, one in six women are ex mis experiencing mistreatment in the United States. This is something that has really shocked us. Um, people of color, of course, we know are experiencing more mistreatment in birth. Um, indigenous women suffer just as much as black women, but the numbers are much lower and the, the studies are not as rife because they're of the smaller populations. But indigenous, indigenous, indigenous and native women are suffering. Hispanic women are suffering. Black women are suffering. The top four types of mistreatment, being shouted at, violation of privacy, threatening to withhold treatment refusing requests for help. This happens all day, every day in the United States, in hospitals, in environments which are supposed to be safe environments. So how does that impact what I do? And what does culturally safe perinatal care look like? 
I am servicing more women of color than not. In the Easy Access Clinic, we see an average of up to a thousand women annually through the clinics. People choose Easy Access Clinics because, first of all, they can get access to them. They choose them because they think hospital birth is the way to have a baby. And we are not here trying to change that um, thought or approach. We are here to support that because we know that listening to women is key. And so we provide prenatal and we provide postpartum care for these women. But what we've done is we've incorporated culturally safe care throughout any of the interactions that we have with them. We make sure that we're providing trauma-informed care because we recognize that that's the only tool we have to mitigate these outcomes, to impact the systems that are going to continue to provide care that the way that they have set up to provide care. Additionally, we've looked at providing trauma-informed care for the staff. It has been quite the journey to transition my British midwife head into providing midwifery services in America because we are fighting um, similar issues, marginalization, lack of professional autonomy, re respect, power, just the same way that our families are fighting those same structural um, um, issues. So trauma-informed care mitigates the structural environment and what I call the pop-up toxicity, the toxicity that impacted Serena Williams um, in her birth experience. Her story is pretty well renowned through the world. She suffered during her postpartum with pulmonary embolism. She knew she was feeling something was wrong. She kept advocating for herself. She nearly died because no one was listening. She was in a hospital. How could a hospital become a materno toxic zone? It became toxic for her because the response to her, the embedded ability and the condoned behavior where implicit bias, where racism, classism and sexism impacts your care and your support to the point that it literally can take your life. So I created this model, I called it the JJ Ways because I didn't know what else to call it. And I'm JJ and, um, you know, it was just a way of trying to essentially break into the system and see if there was a way to um, mitigate and change these outcomes. Um, like I said, I got here in 89. It took me till 94 before I was able to get licensed. I was the first foreign trained midwife in Florida that got a, mid a midwifery license and was able to practice as an independent midwife. Um, what I set out to do when I kept coming up against this brick wall that was barrier after barrier that said, no, you cannot do what you want to do. That's not what we do here. That's not how we do it. And you know, basically we're not gonna work with you. We set out to figure out if we could create a culture or an environment supporting all pregnant women, pregnant people, wherever they wanted to birth, with whomever they wanted to, to birth, and however they wanted to have their care. And the question we posed was, could it make a difference to these outcomes? And we measured the health of the baby by the gestational age and the birth weight and the breastfeeding rates as well. And we really started working with um, this basic fundamental premise. We know every woman wants a healthy baby. We know that every woman wants a healthy baby and every woman deserves one. These black and white pictures that you're seeing, um, these are pictures of patients of ours over the years that we actually turned into a coffee table book. And um, they are real folk from around the way. These are not models. So let me just reiterate, this JJ Way model has these four cornerstones. Our goal is to make sure that every woman has access to care. Every woman has the connections that she needs. Every woman and her family have the knowledge and understanding to become empowered in this experience so that they can survive, so that they can thrive. These were not medical or clinical protocols. These had to come up in the face of those medical and clinical protocols, which seemingly, when impact, um, imp implemented from a place of bias, from a place of power um, dynamic, from a place of um, struggle, were harming and killing mothers and babies. We learned that we could implement these pieces very simply, just by listening to women, just by trusting them, 
just by agreeing with them that they already know what to do and supporting that. And it was that simple. I had to come up with something that didn't cost any money because I didn't have any money. As I was building a practice, I had to become an entrepreneur because we're talking about capitalism here. We're talking about um, power here. We're not just talking about healthcare. So when I saw the title for the work that we're doing over these three days and the, you know, the recovery piece came up for me and I thought about it um, again, a picture of one of the mothers in the practice, you know, how have we implemented recovery? Because we were always in a pandemic. Our pandemic is racism. Our pandemic is classism. Yes, now we have Black Lives Matter come forward again, but before Black Lives Matter, we had um, civil rights, we had the Black Panthers, we had Black people for decades, centuries saying something is wrong, this is not right, this is not equitable. That resilience is there. That resilience has always been there because we're still here and we're still fighting. You see those photos that we took, we were trying to illustrate the power of healthy black women. What does that look like? When I put my book out, people hadn't even seen such pictures. They had no idea. But you see the big belly. This is what we're always about, the full-term baby, which is supposedly hard to do in America. If you're black, you're likely to have a preterm baby. How is that normal? So sustainability is what we're still doing. We're still fighting to sustain these practices and to do this work. And we do that by creating what I call the perinatal safe spots. So the safe spots incorporate the four cornerstones of the JJ way, but the safe spots aren't all clinics. They certainly aren't all midwives because there's not enough of us. The safe spots are areas where whatever person or people have declared them to be so, those people are standing with pregnant women and their families, pregnant people and saying, listen, we will hear you and understand what you need and we will fight with you to get it, to help you get there. So safe spots are run by doulas, safe spots are run by childbirth educators, lactation educators, safe spots could be run by doctors. They are in clinics, they are in existing social services offices. They can be, and they can be in your living room. La Leche League started in somebody's living room all those years ago. I'm in Orlando, as I said, and we utilize this model. This is a midwifery model of care that, again, patient-centered, woman-centered, family-centered, culturally congruent care, accessible care with all of the psychosocial support that is needed. So again, the birthplace is my freestanding birthing center, which has been open since 2003. The Easy Access Women's Health Clinics have been running since 2005. And those clinics, again, we see most of the women in the practices are coming through those clinics because most of American women want to deliver in the hospital. But again, we found a way to create safe, respectful care. We provide and support that dignity. We bring compassion to this work and women oftentimes are in tears, are in breakdown when they get to us and they explain, I've never experienced anything like this. This is what it looks like when you provide care that way. If you might notice the thighs on these children, look at these chunky babies, these beautiful babies that are breastfed and are supported. This is one of our group meetings that we hold at our clinics. These are not typical pictures that you expect to see in the United States. So this is a common sense approach. We're looking at community-based maternity medical homes, if you will, creating safe spots where we can. We put clinical providers in those safe spots, but where we can't, we keep people in those safe spots who are going to be working towards working with whichever clinicians those women have, if any. We have situations in the United States where women don't have a medical provider because they've been turned away. Oh, you're uninsured, you can't pay, you don't have resources, we don't like the way you look. Oh, you're too far advanced in this pregnancy, so now you're too high risk for us to take you. All kinds of crazy reasons that are causing harm. So part of this common sense approach is keeping a reality check recognizing the disparities are real, recognizing that it costs money to get maternity care in the United States. And if you have none, you will not get that care. So our allies have to be real allies and they have to understand the work 
that we're doing and why. I'm grateful that our local hospitals work with me as allies. They do take my patients and know why I'm doing what I'm doing and know what I'm doing and support it. But we also need to build a workforce so that we have providers who are willing to work this way through open to having their clinics um, and open to having um, their, their practices transform into being this kind of approach, being open, having access, regardless of insurance status or financial status, having access regardless of people's home situations or their ability to eat that pristine diet that you've recommended for them. Open to working with them where they are. And our sustainability is only as much as we can bill or as often as we can make um, the insurance pay us, which is often times not very easy. The amount of patients that I've seen and babies I've delivered that I've never gotten paid for, it's really sad that that's the truth, but it is the truth. Again, the goal is transformation. So this is an old slide. This is from 2010. And um, this was one of the um, aspirations and goals and dreams that I put down to see if I could get there. And I'm happy to say we have, we've done most of these things and we continue to add more services. But the easy access clinic services, we're providing, like I said, the prenatal postpartum interconceptional and family planning. We're also doing what I call medical triage. There are women that are way too high risk for me as a midwife, but can't access high risk care without being referred from a practice. So we pass through, we make a way for women to start their care so they can at least get their lab work done and their ultrasound done before we make that referral to high risk so that someone can pick them up and continue their care. We um, collaborate with the hospitals. We do health navigation. We've learned all the systems. We've learned all the hoops. We know the bureaucratic hurdles and we help women bypass those. The birthing services, I do deliver at the birthing center. We deliver uh, anywhere from 60 to 100 women annually through the birthing center who have a natural birth, who choose water birth, but not everybody wants that. And so we do have a smaller practice from that. But those, again, who want the hospital are more than um, encouraged and supported to choose hospital. And we do provide doula support when we can. And then we do a lot of outreach and education. We do home visits, we do support groups, we do community-based mentoring, we have doulas, we have breastfeeding counselors. A lot of these things had to grow up around and in, instead of while we were supporting women who want to continue to use the system. Back in 2006, we did our first study. I wanted to see if anything that I was doing was really making a difference. We already kind of knew it was, but this was a hundred people enrolled prospectively. And we said, let's just see what happens on the other end. And look what happened. I point out the particular stark um, statistic here of the black women in the study. At that time, 21% of black women in Orange County in 2006 were having a preterm birth. 20 percent of people were having a preterm birth. That year, our 100 women, out of the 100 women that we enrolled, the black women, not one preterm birth, not one Hispanic baby was born premature. This happened based on the model I've just described. We didn't have any fancy obstetric stuff. We didn't have any technology. We didn't have, we just were trying to do the care. So by 2010, we'd eliminated the racial disparity. 100, um, easy access women were enrolled. This is not the birth center women. These were not the low risk straightforward women. These were the women with complicated cases, marginalized women. 95% of the babies weighed an average seven and a half pound. 95% of the women delivered at 39 weeks. Recovery. Resilience. This mama had started with us when she had been using um, crack cocaine when she started. She went into institutional care. She stayed in residential care through her pregnancy. I still remember to this day, I went with her when she had a C-section, she had a planned C-section. And I remember her telling the physician, I feel it, I feel it. And she started crying. And the anesthesia team said, oh, you, no, you don't, you're okay. She told them she could feel her cesarean. They continued anyway. I'll never forget her. Sustainability. This is one of our teen moms with one of the chunky babies, which we always seem to have these juicy, juicy babies. We have found ways to sustain this practice, but it hasn't been easy because we still remain outside the system. 
here's one of our um, doulas working with a, a couple. Um, we do a lot of work in our waiting room. We, we provide a lot of resources, wraparound supports. The, we also run our clinics in Spanish and in Portuguese. Um, these are some of the staff from the Easy Access Clinic. These women who support me in the work that I do as a midwife. As far as I'm concerned, they're all midwives. They provide midwifery model care. Um, from left to right, June is a peer counselor and supporter. She keeps our clinics running by providing the outreach education and maintaining community liaisons. Megan is now um, just finished her master's degree. She's heading towards nurse midwifery. To Katrina in, with the pink stethoscope was a medical assistant um, and has been with me um, 15 years. And Alex is also a medical assistant. Um, these amazing women have embrace the model, have joined in with us and helped us to bring these outcomes. We um, have studies that have proven this work is making a difference. In 2014, um, we proved statistically significant for longer gestational periods and lower preterm birth rates for women of color in the practice using the same model I've described. Um, in 2017, we did a, an evaluation of the maternity center to see, again, what's happening here. Is this a model that can be replicated? Is this a model that should be replicated? Once again, zero disparities in preterm births. We managed that year, 2017, to show, and there were about 240 women in this study, um, that we, at that point, the black rate for women um, having preterm births was lower than the white counterparts in Orange County and in Florida and across the nation. Remember those? Okay, so the solutions are really clear to me, um, clear to people who believe and support what we're doing. I think clear to midwives around the world who understand the midwifery model of care and the power of the midwifery model of care. It is protective in maternal toxic zones and in situations. Um, if you're willing to do work this way, you will make a difference. We've been able to make sure that we provide access to safe quality care, that it's appropriate level care, that it's at any site with any choice that the mother has. But we also want to make sure that the providers have access to being able to work this way, to break down these historical and structural harms and these barriers that have caused and continue to perpetuate these poor outcomes. We know the providers need access to cultural humility training and to implicit bias training. And we know that students need access to scholarships and grants for training purposes. We need more student midwives. Um, we need student midwives of color. We need um, a community um, of uh, providers of color that can serve all areas and disciplines. We organize on a national level. We're building a movement to birth a more just and loving world through this perinatal task force that I've formed. And we are proudly, I'm thrilled to be able to announce that we are now accredited as a private midwifery school, the first and only black owned midwifery school in the United States of America. So this is what you get when you put together access, connection, knowledge and empowerment for everyone. Everyone, this is equity. Here are some of the babies over the years. We had a reunion last year and it was really amazing. Um, we managed to get this picture captured and I love this picture. So many of these people in this picture um, started with me as home birth mothers and families and now um, through the birth center, through the Easy Access Clinic and through the reach of our work, we've been able to get to what I say is the road to recovery. The resilience has always been there we're working on the sustainability. At the end of the day, this is about human rights. And so I'd be more than happy to take your questions and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jenny. That was an absolutely tremendous uh, presentation and fascinating as well uh, for the degree to which, I mean, the word that jumped out at me was the work that you do in navigation, yes. navigating uh, women through the process, identifying all the risk elements. Um, interestingly, we've had a note from uh, Lena Duncan saying that they've noticed the same sort of variations in behaviours and service uh, provided in trusts in the UK. So, you know, this is not a peculiar issue. Of, no. I have to say the figures, and, and in Britain, we are struggling with the five times uh, the number of deaths uh, for black women compared to white women that, that came out in the um, 
Chief Nurse's report and the Hobson Gynie are working on it. What's interesting to me, just say a bit more about the, the battle that you've had really in the professional world to identify the role of the kind of outreach midwifery that you're doing, if that's a, a fair mm. description. Yes, it is outreach midwifery. I mean, honestly, it's like being in a disaster zone. Um, that's why I said it felt, I feel like the pandemic has been here. This is, yes, brought forward now, COVID-19 has made us more aware of it. And we now are like just recognizing that, yes, when it impacts everybody, then, oh, we do really want to pay attention. But this is very, um, it's very difficult to implement because in America, the business of medicine is what reigns. Capitalism is the part that has to be acknowledged. So we are up against a, a system where money is key and so midwifery doesn't fit into that model in the same way as it does where there's universal access to health care health is not a human right health has to be afforded and those that are not able to afford are ostracized so the navigation began from the place of first of all understanding even as a provider how do i navigate how do i get access and i did not gain access I had to fight to be able to be licensed and to work, and I'm still outside of the system. Even though we are very collaborative and we've worked hard to build those relationships, that's not mandated. It's if you feel like it. It's if you like this midwife. It's if you prefer to, you know, affiliate or not. You don't have to. And that leaves us in a real tenuous situation. And then on top of that, midwifery, when we're serving marginalized people, technically, we immediately go out of our scope. Because unfortunately, in the United States, the marginalized folk are the people who are becoming high risk, not from physiological risk, but from the impact of social risk, racism, classism, um, power, um, those risks, whether and harm and cause the um, stress related manifestations of poor outcomes. I say that because I know that when we are able to work with women, especially long term through the pre perinatal times, those risks are mitigated. We aren't seeing preeclamptic women, therefore we're not seeing prematurity. We aren't seeing diabetic women, therefore we're not having, you know, babies that can't be born. We're all of the issues that seem to culminate by getting women to term are mitigated, even though they continue to exist. So we've learned that if we know how to navigate the systems on behalf of and alongside of the women and their families, we can help lower the stress that those barriers are, are adding and therefore physiologically impact the outcome. I've always asked this question and I don't think we'll ever get the answer. What is it about being kind or being decent or supporting and, and in, encouraging the, you know, respect and dignity? What is it about that that has that cervix locked tight? That without that, the cervix would open, the baby would be born at 28 weeks. How do you have such impact on physiology based on these non-tangible pieces, which without the effort and work on our end to figure out how to navigate and help women through, they would not get the benefit of the respectful care or the listening ear that we provide. And when with you, when, one when or the, they can't go one without the other, they are one, two punch, they belong together. When are you connecting with women in the cycle of their pregnancy? Right now, because of the years of work and because of the you know, outreach that we have done, we get them early. People are calling me five weeks, six weeks because they know we will answer that call. Everywhere else you're shut out. There's this sort of strange tension between getting into providers who will turn you away at the drop of a hat if you're 20 weeks. Oh, you're too far advanced, too late, too high risk, go away. But yet when you call at you know, 10, 12 weeks, oh no, we don't wanna see you yet. And so, all of these sort of strange, perverse barriers and hoops, bureaucratic hurdles are preventing women getting access. So the access that we provide is that we will pick up the phone or we'll answer your text as early as we can. And we start with you immediately. When you reach out, you're in, there isn't a barrier. And that has been the biggest piece. And the fact that we've done that has been ridiculed, has been, we're considered a nuisance because Leaving it bar 
barrier-free like that means we're not fighting with women about money. We're not fighting about insurance. Rather, we're saying, come on and we'll triage you and help you figure out how to get that insurance, how to get um, onto um, a Medicaid plan, how to afford it, or even to agree with you that you just plain can't afford it. I had a homeless woman 38 weeks call us last week. She'd been seen at the emergency room at the triage department at the hospital and told, well, Jenny Joseph might take you. So she called me because no one else will take her. She is relegated to keep walking the streets until she goes into labor, at which point they will tut tut, roll their eyes and give her a hard time about presenting in labor without having had prenatal care. Hmm. This is how it's completely, it's just cruel so in so many bits, ways. The only bits that are successfully covered by the Obamacare reforms are uh, the actual birth or is this simply other facilities gaming the system to avoid what they regard as difficult cases or, yes. or not maximized billing cases. The latter. And sadly, not everybody takes the um, insurance, particularly the one that most low income people are on, which is Medicaid. They mm -hmm. don't take it. They don't want to be bothered with it. It doesn't pay enough. It's a headache. And that's another structural deep system that impacts and causes, as far as I'm concerned, all of these harms. Um, the causes of death are not what you would expect. Oh, hemorrhage, um, high blood pressure. Yes, those are a result of. But mm. deep down, the structural reasons, the root causes are these social and um, societal ways of being this capitalistic ways of being that say you don't belong if you don't have money, if you don't have power. And that's but a problem. Interestingly, I mean, I think from the presentations that we've had earlier today um, about some marginalized communities in the UK, that even if you can have a, f a free universal system, uh, yes. there will still be actually a great many of the barriers that you described, we heard about Somali women, we heard about, different, we've, there's a lot of identification about the problems of Bangladeshi women uh, yes. and their access to service, not just language, but the ability of the services to reach out to them. And even where they have a very diverse workforce in parts of London, they can get it right. In other places, they're, they seem to be getting it wrong. And it's, interestingly, the, the outreach and the wraparound, in other words, not regarding yes. the, the clinical issues as separate from their social and cultural and race issues. That seems to be the message from, uh, from your, uh, your program. Yes, absolutely. Cultural congruence is key, but also we as providers have to figure out where we can get off our high horse, move the ego aside and come back to what we all committed to. Mm -hmm. As midwives, we've always centered the patient but now these are the times where we learn and understand differently that to center the patient means move yourself out from the middle as well. Midwife-centered care is not safe care. Agency-centered care, hospital-centered care is not safe care. Culturally congruent care where the mother family, mother baby family are centered is where the safety starts and finishes. Once we acknowledge that, we can then as providers embrace other team players. The people that most, um, that the women most connect with are my medical assistants, my peer paraprofessionals, my um, you know auxiliary um, staff. They're not that bothered about what the midwife has to say or not. It's not about me. It's not about even what I'm offering in my clinical practice. It's about we come here because you will talk to us. You treat us right. There's no judgment. And anybody who has a heart can provide care that way. And it's not about these deep, you know, we must have these competencies and we must have these skills. Not necessarily. Not and to so get what we need. You're, you're also, obviously, from the presentation, quite active on policy and uh, you get yes. recognition in the clinical journals. How does your work connect with the kind of work we were hearing from uh, Neil Shah at Harvard, where his wide studies have been identifying that uh, a mother giving birth in the United States today is 50% more likely to die than her mother uh, because of, if you like, this medicalization, the failure to provide the kind of wraparound that you're describing that means that 
the mother and the baby are fit and ready to be born safely and uh, to prosper afterwards. How, do you, how are you connecting with the other groups that are yeah. like, like Neil's? Um, yes, we are quite active and, you know, um, um, I really appreciate Neil's work and his colleagues. We, you know, there's a lot of uh, movement, if you will, going on where we're really keen to get to policymakers. So, for example, I'm um, one of the advisory board members for the Black Maternal Health Caucus, which is a congressional caucus that is working on um, bills. We have nine bills in a omnibus package, which are addressing um, these um, poor outcomes, maternal health outcomes, particularly for Black women. But across the board, we're seeing that, you know, the, the consumers are also mobilizing. Um, there's definitely a, a lot more interest um, about birth trauma, birth um, obstetric violence. Um, you know, we realize that we've got power in the consumers and the women are speaking out. But remember, we're still couched inside of hospital is where you deliver and there's nothing that you can do about a mindset that says that these services are providing safe care, even though the truth is now coming out. And not to say that all hospitals don't provide safe care, but we have known about the impact of cesareans. And yeah, there's a little bit of a slowing, but not anywhere near enough because part of the purpose of capital capitalism in, in healthcare is you need to sell services. You need to fill the NICU, the, the neonatal intensive care unit, the special care baby unit has to be full of babies to be, you know, lucrative. And so whose babies are in there? The babies of the marginalized. They're full of black and brown babies in the, in the NICUs. The women who are more likely to get cut are of color. The women who are more likely to die are of color, are, are low income, are marginalized. This is unfortunately part of the process. So we can do all the policies, um, make, change all the policies, make all of these um, you know, safety bundles and trainings and all of this, but be clear, the hospital is run by people who are trying to make money and you cannot take away the services that make the most money and expect a hospital to be able to continue even to survive they will argue that that will kill their hospital okay jenny on that uh, forceful point uh, yeah. we need to bring it to an end thank you very much for your contribution i'm sure you'll get a lot thank of you. feedback as this goes round. and i can see from uh, some of the online media and things that lots of people recognize uh, some of what you're describing as failings that are common across other mm -hmm. systems perhaps not quite as brutally and sharp as you experience them in the United States. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And uh, no doubt we'll be in touch. Well done. Yes, thank you so much. Great.